five, four, three, two, one. The Sofa Club is live. Hi, I'm Campbell X and welcome to Peccadillo Pictures Sofa Club. Tonight we've got a treat for you with the film Cicada. Now Cicada was written by Matt Pfeiffer and Sheldon D. Brown. They're both acting in the film as well. Matt Pfeiffer and Kieran Mulcair directed Cicada. And we also have the producers, Jeremy Truong and Ramphis Myrtle. In addition, we have a psychotherapist on the panel, Joelle Simpson. Thank you um, for being here and being part of this um, Q&A. The first thing I want to ask you really is, you're all coming from so many dis different locations, different backgrounds. How did you all come together for this um, film? You know, what did you know each other before? Have you worked together before? Who wants to take that, Matt or Kieran? Yeah, yeah, we all knew each other um, beforehand, except uh, Ramphis came on at the end. Uh, we were lucky to have him come on. Um, what was that in July, Ramphis? Yeah, summer, summer 2018. Summer, yeah. Um, Sheldon and I had met in 2015. Uh, we went on a similar date to the one you see in the film. He lives in Chicago. I live in New York. It's about, what would you say, like a 10 hour drive, Sheldon? I think so, like 13 to 15 hours. 15 hours, okay, yeah. So I wrote this script in the winter of 2018. And I thought, well, Sheldon would be amazing at this. Um, and I had never seen him act before, but I knew he could sing. I'd been watching his videos on Instagram. And I hit him up and I said, if you're in New York, you know, let's, I have this project, I think you'd be really good for it. And he texted uh, text back that he was actually there right now. He was doing uh, Sleep No More, right, Sheldon? Yeah, I was performing at Sleep No More. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so we grabbed a drink uh, across from the stoop we first met at this little bar called Syndicated in Bushwick. And we didn't talk about the movie, just caught up. He read the script about a week or two later. And uh, yeah, and we just it moved really fast. And then in um, April, I got the text um, from Sheldon that something uh, terrible had happened. Yeah, I, um, we, yeah, that was 2015. We went on, we went on this date and that at the time it was like, I was like maybe a few months. I just came out like maybe a few months before to some friends and went on to Tinder and, you know, first time swiping right on, on dudes and exciting time to be alive uh and yeah after after that weekend in new york matt and i just stayed in, in close contact and, and caught up every time i was in the city so it just happenstance that we were in the same place at the same time and, and uh in january of 2018 uh and then in april of 2018 um coming home from a friend's birthday party in Chicago here, uh, where, which is where I live. Um, I was shot late night in a drive-by shooting. And I was in the hospital for a month in April. Um, I had no idea if I was going to be able to perform again. Um, and Matt was checking in on me and seeing how I was doing um, and was still interested in doing this film. Um, and I could only think like, <laughs> Why me? Like you haven't even seen me perform. I'm like I'm not in any condition. I don't I don't know if I'll be in any condition to uh, to perform. But uh, something that has always just been with me um, anytime I perform or in, in facing trauma or tragedy, um, I often have you know I'm lucky as an artist to always have something to kind of try to process what I'm going through through my art. Um, and so that was a, a great opportunity to um, to be able to do something to try to get through what I was going through. Um, and so I just came onto the film um, and wrote, wrote my own personal experience into the film. Um, and you know the 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 work transformed from there. Um, and then I believe 
three months after I got out of the hospital, we started we started filming this film. So um, that comes from quite an intimate start. So I'm wondering, Kieran, how then you fit into this because you know. There's Matt and Sheldon bonding, um, yeah. you know, co-writing, acting, and you're a co-director. I know how, you know, tough it is to direct solo, never mind with somebody else. And also with somebody else who's writing about their own story, who is acting in it. How did the two of you manage to not kill each other, basically? Just say. We love each other. Which is a silly, it might sound, I don't know, it's hard to... I care about him and I cared about uh it was funny because I was woven in before before that the the most recent tragedy um and so Matt and I had connected early on in an acting class where I was I was working on a scene about uh a guy dealing with his childhood sexual abuse and I I was you know I came forward about my own experience with it in my life um which is what you do in acting class. And um, so <laughs> I had talked about that and we, we connected then on that subject. And my, oh, it was maybe a year later, he had sent me this script and um, I re it was my favorite script. I hadn't read a script like that before. And I'd been curious about directing um, for a while and I, it, but anyway, I, I read the script and, you know, gushed uh, at him over dinner one night. And then he asked if I'd be interested in directing it. And then he was talking about casting, who'd cast for the role of Ben. And I was like, Matt, you have to, you have to do that. And Matt's a great actor and he doesn't know that. And so I, I, I told him I thought he'd regret it if he didn't play it. And so that was when, when we came up with the co-directing idea. Um, and as we said before, you know, the script was very, there, there were a lot of changes that came along the way. And I was, I was lucky enough to have an early conversation you know, with, with Sheldon um, uh, close to that time. And we got to talk about the character and he had, you know, yes, it's inspired by Sheldon, but there are a lot of things about the character that are not Sheldon. And he had such a hold on the inner life of that character that I was, very relieved that that was the actor I was getting to work with, you know, in my first in my first venture into this, um, and so it 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 rose organically from that. And in, in as an actor, analogy is big in in our work. You're always it's like you're one step removed from your experience. You're bringing your personal experience to it. I had had plenty of experience doing that as an actor. Uh, what I hadn't had was the experience of, of expressing my own, you know, experience through directing. And um, I had seen the subject handled all sorts of ways and all sorts of films. And so when it's not honored with honest performances, it's very disturbing. <laughs> you can feel almost re-traumatizing when you see, you know, people not accurately representing um, what you've gone through. And I, there, I also just want to touch on Sh Sheldon. Sheldon was dealing with something he had, that was so fresh mm. um, that, you know, you just kind of stand back in awe of that sort of bravery. Um, uh, it was really a privilege to see that. You know, Matt, Matt and I do have the honor, I mean, the, the advantage of, of at least being a little farther in time from our trauma. Um, so that was, that was very special. Uh, and I felt really privileged to be a part of that. Thank you. And we're privileged that you could <clears throat> share those experiences through a creative process and art with us in such a tender, vulnerable way. Thank you for uh, um, all your responses. I'm going to go to, um, Jeremy and Ramfis actually, because this film can't have been an easy sell in, you know, in a culture where you know, often gay and bisexual men are in a rom-com format. Um, <clears throat> and that tends to be the commercial model at the moment. So how, how did you manage to um, convince people to make the film? And did you both work with each other before? You know, how, what was the process? Yeah, I guess it, it's um 
it was, it was, I think the way that we ended up doing things was just like not necessarily waiting for permission or, you know, like needing to necessarily go to people to like decide if this is something that was worth making. I think there was always this general idea that was like, we're going to make this and let's see like what we can pull together. And in the case of this film too, it was like, I mean, we had almost no time because from the time that we had decided like, okay, Sheldon is going to come and we're going to do this. It was like, you know, a, like a month or something that, that we had to like really prep and shoot this thing, which was crazy because it was, I mean, the, the film has already cut like 20 actors from it. There, there was like an, like so many actors and so many things that we had to prepare for it. So we did kind of fly by the seat of our pants a little bit in that we shot what we could in this first round. We shot in like four different rounds or something of like pickups and stuff. And we would just kind of like shoot it and then like show people like, hey, this is something that we think it's worthwhile and like we need money to, to like do this next step. And Rampus came on board and, and sort of in the middle of that process and definitely helped us out with that. And like we got uh, the raining grant, which really like more, more or less helped us finish the primary bulk of this filming. And then we kind of went back and, and added things as, as we went on, but it was a really sort of like, you know, step-by-step -step process in some ways. And, and I think in some ways that was also quite beneficial too. Like we had a really long time to really sit with it and identify stuff that we wanted to do with the film from, from where it was. I think the script and, and like where the characters were is like miles apart from where it is now, so. That sounds really good to know actually, because a lot of people tend to think, oh, I've got to have all the money in place before I move on. And, and what you all did um, in this team was you trusted the process. Um, I want to ask Remphis, what then made you think, oh, I want to be part of this, um, you know, and work to help it to be completed? What was your kind of mindset doing that? Yeah, well, what had happened was that um, I had come off um, another film and uh, a mutual colleague of uh, Matthew and I had uh, introduced me to the project and uh, had sent me the package. And I was just like really impressed with uh, what Matt had has done, you know, um, you know, up until then. Uh, with his previous projects and his background and it just seemed like a really aggressive project at the time um so i remember you know coming and meeting the team and um i was just like really impressed because at the time jeremy was only 22 <laughs> and i was just like blown away um by the organization the skill set and the creative um, and just the talent all around there. And um, I really, you know, fell in love with Matt and his story and um, the journey throughout the process. So um, I, I wanted to be, you know, on the team and, and um, pretty much came and, you know, supported the process. And I feel that um, along the way, um, I was able to use a lot of uh, relationships that I had that really, you know, helped the project along. And, you know, um, you know, SF film was really like supportive, which, you know, activated um, us going to Tribeca through the Tribeca Film Institute, which really gave like a spotlight, you know, on the film. Uh, we got to meet, you know, Jeffrey Winter there, who's our sales rep, who really battered for us because throughout this process, the one thing is that, you know, I'm always amazed, but I'm not amazed at what we've been able to do because we've, we made a lot of errors. There are a lot of things that, we did um, that were not right or incorrect, but you know we learned at, um, as a team. We collaborated together. You know we were always on the same page. We communicated together, and we had each other's back. It wasn't, you know, I think Kieran did a really good job at this because it was a very sensitive and it was raw. You know, like um, you know, Selden had just you know gone through this trauma and still was going through the trauma, and then you know, Matt had to relive the trauma that he had gone through, you know, so it was such a good balance in being able to deal with emotions and feelings and sensitivity um, and, and telling a really important, you know, story, you know, like that. So I feel as a whole, everybody had their uh, path, their lane, um, and no one stepped on each other's toes and we all helped each other out. And I think the reason why this project has been so successful is that, um, other people can see that and they can feel that 
and they want to support, you know, um, the story, which I think is why Film Collaborative has really had gotten behind the project and they had done things outside of their um, job description to really help the project. And Jeffrey, I think, kind of became a mentor to everyone on the team and just telling us the pros, the cons, and ultimately letting us decide, you know, what we wanted to do, but giving his professional opinion. So I think without Jeffrey Film Collaborative, you know, SF uh, Film and TFI, you know, we wouldn't be where we're at. They all supported the process. And um, as Jeremy said, we did a lot of screenings, um, you know, Killer Films, you know, at one point was giving us some notes and support and guidance. And one of their reps came out to, uh, to a screening, you know, of ours. And, you know, that was just all helpful. And also getting people that were not familiar, you know, with anyone on the team, to give feedback so it wasn't you know um it was there was no conflict there you know so they can give like raw feedback and we know you know what we had to do and i think that's how we got this product because this was uh, an ever-changing project throughout you know the years up until the last moment you know i want to say um and uh you know i think we did a good job as a team you know I, the creative is one thing but i think what's as important maybe sometimes more important is having a good team. And that's what we have here. I love you. Richard. I, we love you. <laughs> I, know, I mean, it, it says it all. And this is kind of like a masterclass in collaborative working, in gelling, in communication. So if there are any budding filmmakers out there. This is really um, one to watch. And the people that you mentioned, Killer Films, that's um, Christine Vachon's production company, who is a legend um, in um, queer uh, filmmaking and was part of the new queer cinema movement. And Jeffrey Hinton is um, one uh, partner in the film collaborative um, who distributes films, don't they? They sort of help films get out into like a film festival circuit. So that's just for people who might not know um, the, the these these names but they're worth they're worth knowing and following um on on the interwebs i'm going to go into something a little bit um you know <clears throat> dealing with one of the themes in the film which is about dating in new york and uh, you know is that like a, a, a genre like every time we see a film <laughs> in new york is about dating what is it hard or is it easy like what's going on with new york and the dating stuff <laughs> kieran i'm coming to you because you're laughing <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I got called on privilege. I got called on my <laughs> privilege for this, but I never thought I really had. But I was like, God, if I can date okay in here, anyone can. Um, but uh uh I didn't I didn't have a lot of dating. I've been with my boyfriend for 15 years, and so I didn't have smartphones did not exist when we started dating. Um, so yeah, so I have an over the shoulder awareness of Grinder, and I find it wildly <laughs> entertaining. Um, Hinge, Bumble, it's fascinating to me. Um, so you picked the wrong person, but thank you for letting me weigh in. <laughs> I might pick the right person because, <laughs> because I don't use apps, but, um, <laughs> so what about you, Jeremy Sheldon, Matt and Ramfis? Because that, you know, with the ASL thing, when you sit on the stoop and you talk through that, it's such a cute moment. And so like, do people still do that? Like on the apps or, it's or did you true, just... It's pure chaos at this point. <laughs> um... I mean, we, oh my God. I mean, this film, this film really cut down on it, but we used to have like a million sequences prior to, <laughs> um, <laughs> prior to Matthew and Sheldon. Yeah, we had this. Yeah, we had a, we had a grinder sequence in there. Yeah, we had a grinder sequence where we had about 15 to 20 men who sat on toilets for us, all different toilets. So it was really hard to scout that many toilets because there are only two toilets in New York City. I don't know if you've ever visited, but it's one Starbucks mm -hmm. in Midtown and the other one <laughs> is a public toilet um, in Coney Island. So we had to find um, a lot of toilets and that's kind of what dating is. You know that the person talking to you with like these abs and um, you know, this catfish face that he's on a toilet right now or they're on a toilet. And that's where we're all dating from. But well, I will... most of those, hopefully most of those toilets have bidets. So <laughs> I right. just I just got one. It's amazing. Highly recommend. Tushy. <laughs> I don't know if you Tushy. Not sponsored. 
<laughs> yeah, not spon- others are available. Um, speaking of like dating and the film, one of the things I thought was really interesting about the film in talking about dating was that <clears throat> often we don't see films about bisexual men or if like the main character is bisexual, usually the supporting character is bisexual and then it's problematized in a quite toxic way. Um, and that must have an effect on a lot of bisexual men to see representation of themselves in that way. And I want, um, you know, Matt, Kieran, Sheldon to comment on that. And maybe Joel, you can also add something to it from a therapeutic point of view in the effect of not seeing yourself but only seeing yourself in a toxic, you know, in a toxic, in the way often bisexual men are seen as disease carriers or cheaters. I mean, it's horrible. Um, In a way, bisexual women are seen as super hot and up for threesomes. It's not the same. So um, Matt, do you want to say something about that and writing a character like that and, you know, playing a character like that, the importance to you of doing that in in the film? Definitely. And thanks for bringing it up. I can only speak from my own experience. Yes, we see a lot of bisexual women on screen these days. And uh, I think when we do see bisexual men, they are murderers. <laughs> they, I can think of like Kevin Spacey in House of Cards. Um, that's what comes into my head. I, you know, so much of my, the pain of my experience was thinking that I was queer because of what had happened to me. And if that didn't happen to me, then I wouldn't be queer. And I think so much of uh, why I never experimented um, before um, I was a young adult was I I didn't want him to win, like I say in the film. And that doesn't discount the women that I was with before that. Um, And it doesn't mean now that I, you know, I could meet somebody and I'm like, wow, yeah, that, that's, uh, that's possible. I uh, didn't expect that to happen today. And I think that once uh, gay men um, come out or, or queer men come out, it, it took so much energy and um, emotion to get to that place that to, to, to slip back or to tell your gay friends, oh yeah, I'm still, I could still, you know, um, enjoy being with, um, someone who's not a man, it's like so off-putting to them. Um, and they think you're lying or you're confused. Um, and I think female friends as well, they, they, be, they, you know, they think, well, why not me? Why aren't you with me if you still have these feelings? Um, so it's complicated. And I think putting a label and saying, hey, I'm gay is, you know, I'm 31 years old now. It's, it's like, uh, it's, it's easier to say you're gay than, uh, than you're bi or you're queer yeah. or you're on the spectrum. I find that like you explain your sexuality to someone and they get confused and then they call you confused. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know what projection is? Yeah, Joel. I think one of the wonderful things about the film is that we get to hear from the bisexual person themselves what their experience is. And I think that so often there is somebody given their um, perception um, about what it might be. But I think what's very beautiful here is we hear it from Ben, from, um, from ben, him, from ben himself. And I think the film is really, really good in speaking to that silence and really giving him an opportunity to speak for many men who um, have um, the experience of bisexuality, but perhaps cannot articulate it for themselves. And so here you have these two lovers having this opportunity to come together and to say what it is like for themselves. And I think that's really, really powerful um, to give people that voice. And I think many people will resonate with that as well. Thanks, thanks Joel, for that. Um, and would you say that's a common thing that you hear in your practice that, you know, a lot of times people are really, as, as Matt was saying, afraid to own um, bisexuality because it's very binary, you're either straight or gay. Yeah. You're, Exactly. I think people need to be able to um, have their own voice, their own experience, you know, and speaking from their own intersection as well, how this relates to their own cultural experience as well. 
and and I think the film does that really really well. Thank you. Yeah, it it it, it does it beautifully, um, Matt and Kieran. You know, good job, and also with the performances with you, Matt and Sheldon. I'm going to ask a thing that I I find what I found really powerful about the film, speaking about the unspoken, was <clears throat> the, um, you're in an interracial relationship, the two lead characters, but there is no shying away from the issues that it, being in an interracial relationship brings, which often get removed from LGBTQ films, all of them. They're, they're, people are very willing to cast interracial relationships as a kind of, yeah, we've got that diversity tick, but not deal with the reality. How did that come about? Because I was, my jaw literally dropped and I was getting anxiety just watching it because I was going to, I was like, oh my God, this is so real. Where's this going? How was it for you both? And how, like, please tell me a little bit about it. You want to go, Sheldon? I have experience, but Matt and I both have experiences in being in um, an interracial relationship. And, you know, you're right. You're absolutely right. In, a lot, in, in, in many films, in TV in general, not even just with queerness, but, you know, interracial relationships are just kind of like a, just a spectacle, you know, and you get, it, you know, maybe, maybe there's some kind of great feelings of being like, oh, look at this, like two different backgrounds are together and you know and that there that are, there is some beautiful wonderful explorations you find and understanding another person's upbringing culture and history um and navigating that together but it's i mean it's and, and it's true authenticity there in the con in this country in the u.s you can't have relationships like these without jumping into the dynamics of what that relationship is going to be with someone who is black and someone who is white um, and me and Matt have this conversation throughout the entire film. Like, we have to make this feel authentic. Um, you know, it can't just be, uh, you know, we don't want to hit that, you know, we want to go too heavy handed with um, how things are, are depicted, but we want to be truthful, you know, and, and these experiences are not, you know, I've been in relationships where I am the only Black person in my white boyfriend's friend group right now uh and that does something you know and you're sharing your lives with each other you're sharing your friends you're sharing your family you're sharing your experiences um and then you're doing that in front of hundreds or millions if you're in new york city millions of people who are watching you and they have their own thoughts and opinions of what that should be um and so us being truthful to this relationship is also being truthful to who we are. Um, and I had no interest in being, you know, just the black magical boyfriend who helps my white boyfriend grow. You know, uh, Sam has his own shit to <laughs> deal with. Um, and they help each other grow by being honest um, from where they're coming from. And, you know, I think that's some of the beautiful things about it. It's like, even through some difficulties or hardships of trying to learn each other, um, you're helping each other grow by unlearning things that have been conditioned on each of us through racism, um, through oppression. Um, through, through religion, Sheldon, I thought you captured that quite beautifully, particularly that, that, that sex scene where you had, I think, Jesus saves outside the, um, outside the room. I thought it was such a wonderful way to bring in a conversation around religion and its impact upon, um, well, many people, particularly, but particularly on the Black gay experience. I wonder how that was for you in portraying that. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting because my own family is not super religious in a way, so I didn't feel bound by my religion. I mean, maybe at church I felt that way, but not for my family, you know? Yeah. Um, but, you know, there is that, there is that um, interesting balance you have to strike about your relationship with your faith or maybe your relationship with your family that is connected by faith and that influence it has on your ability to to embrace yourself, you know? Um, and there's some questions 
there, you know, there's some conflict, internal conflict you're having, you know, because, you know, with Sam, he really does love his dad, you know, and looking at Ben and his mom, it's like an entirely different relationship in a sense of being like, this is a person who's like totally okay and embracing their child. And, you know, in actuality, Sam is like battling himself, you know, he's like, you know, I don't necessarily know, we don't necessarily discover what happens with him and his dad, but it's the idea that you you're carrying so much internal repression that you kind of fight yourself and feeling like you can open up, you know, that you can open up to your family and let your and, and let them in. You know, we have this whole coming out situation, but it's like, why is it necessarily a coming out as it is you're calling everyone in? I'm calling my family in to who I really am. Um, and so, you know, I think that Sam is learning to just decolonize and uncondition himself uh, through this relationship and through his his upbringing to truly embrace himself and love himself. Yes. Um, thanks for that. You know, I want to go a little bit deeper into the into the theme of the film and um, the process for all of you, because everybody has spoken quite honestly and tenderly about the trauma that they've experienced, that you've experienced. And this goes not just to um, the directors and the writers, but also the producers. It must have been quite an intense period making this film. How did you look after yourselves like while, while you did it? Because Matt, you're writing about your own experiences. You're in it. You're directing it. Kieran, you've spoken about your own experiences. Sheldon, you just came out of a trauma. I don't know what happened to Gemma and Ramphis, but, you know, um, masculinity has its own trauma in itself. You know, growing up as a boy into a man, you're crushed. You know, um, Bell Hooks speaks about this. So how, how, how did you look after yourselves in this process to make this thing so beautiful and to come here now to speak about it so openly, tenderly, and, you know, caringly with each other? Please do share, because I think it's quite important for other filmmakers, but even other people who've gone through experiences, how we can push through to the other side. So I'll go to you, Matt. Um, <clears throat> and then Kieran and then Sheldon. Anybody else wants to pitch in, please do. A lot of a lot of patience, a lot of love, um, feeling held. Um, Kieran always said that every single day that he wanted to feel held, he wanted us to feel held. And and you know, Jeremy was not only holding boom like sometimes, but he was cooking chicken teriyaki. And oh my he was, god always putting so much love into it and and Ramphis was you know trying to get more money and also at the same time try to be on set and we made this thing for under 50k like we shot for under 50k which is uh, an absurd yeah. small amount of money um so it was breathing every day Kieran would literally stand over me and do this meditation every single day and we would find peace um and when i couldn't get through a scene sheldon would just give me a hug or he'd rub my back and tell me it was all going to be okay and uh i just i don't know how we did it i just thinking back now and how, how lucky we got and how lucky i got with this this magical team and um i still don't know why they all said yes but it is it is so cool to be here today with you all um, as we continue to talk about it. So it's very cool to have you, and thanks for sharing, Matt. Kieran, um, you know, uh, you're not in it, but you're in it. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, Thank you. <laughs> um, can, can I pass the baton now? No, I'm checking. Um, uh, I remember there's this one one time I had you know, relax, relax is step one in acting. And I, I remember one time guiding Matt through meditation while he was lying on his back on the sidewalk outside, like, you know, a sidewalk in Manhattan. And it was outside a hospital and there was this person rapping on the window, like, like 10 stories up. 
saying, pointing to get up. And I just, I knew exactly what they were saying, but I just kept saying, oh, he's fine. He's fine. And they kept tapping. And I was like, he's fine. He's fine. We're just, he's fine. Um, yeah. It was a funny memory to swim up on me. I was, we did this really fast. Fast is no way to hold space for trauma. It's just yeah. no way to hold space for trauma. So especially people um, out there, you know, creators out there, it might feel a lot like closing your eyes and doing it as fast as possible, ripping the bandaid off really fast. It was almost like that. It's it's amazing what the the uh, I, I guess the the fizzling beyond has been for uh, for me, but I think for all of us. Um, and that has carried more healing to see that. <laughs> oh, to see the story told was a very healing process, and to share it, share it with other people, you know, yeah, especially people who came forward at our screenings and said, "Oh, I, you know, I went through that." Um, it was very. Uh, that was when we started to feel like, okay, we have some good cuts, <laughs> you know. And then during the process, I was reading a lot of the Dao De Ching, the Stephen Mitchell translation. Um, I, I, I have real issues with authority and I don't, I just don't like authority. Um, and so being in a position of authority feels like I wear it like an ill-fitting suit. And so I was, I was really committed to saying, you know, I'm not in charge. The truth is in charge. The truth of the story is in charge. And I just have to make sure that everybody is in line with the truth of the story. And so that was really all I, um, all I wanted to do, um, but it's hard. It's, it was too fast to really hold the space needed to be held for people re-experiencing trauma. Um, and I, I, oh, sorry. I was just wondering, I'm just noticing your own speed as you're speaking now, and I was just curious about what's, what's touching you as you're sharing this with us again and recounting it. I think when we shot the last scene with Matt, the direction I'd given him was um, speak for the little boy you were, yeah. you know? And another real act of bravery was being able to say those words, you know, a few feet from, from where these events took place. We were in his backyard and it feels like, um, it does feel like you know a younger part of yourself is being spoken for. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Kieran, for sharing that. Just take a little deep breath um, before, um, if anybody wants to add to that. But thank you so much, Kieran. We've got some questions from the audience. Um, Sheldon, did you want to add anything, or should I go to questions from the audience? Gratitude. Just grateful. I what think at any moment in which I thought, well, what, you know, and there are, many, there are moments where we're getting into the thick of things, and it's like, why did I, why did I just say I was going to do this? Why did I say I was going to do this? Why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? Um, but the gratitude, being grateful that I could, that I'm here, and I had the ability to do. And sometimes what I am have learned and learning is we might not have the right answers or direction, but we might have the ability to just continue and do and go and be, and hopefully in that being you can be better and i feel having no clue of where this was going to go when we were doing that we were all still in such honesty to ourselves and to each other but also thinking that someone is going to witness this and yeah. um, we want to hold them in that as well yeah. and look at where we are, you know, it's a testament that this was meant to be, you know, we were meant to do this work. Um, and I have everyday validation that I'm still here and doing what I love to do, that I'm meant to be doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, and so I don't necessarily have a direction or a, 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 
a huge agenda on it, but I know if I move from a place of gratitude, um, there's so much power and strength in that. Yeah. And it's been, it's been holding me down. Thank you so much. So beautiful. Joelle, a few yeah. words. Just Thank you. Words, just, just in response to Sheldon and, and, and to Kieran and to, and, and to Matt, just a really appreciation for bringing in the small boy, the little boy who, um, who ultimately who this story is about. But there's um, this sense of what can't be spoken about, what can't be thought about. And we see that acted out through the, the compulsive sex and wanting to talk to mom and mom kind of infantilizes and wants to keep the boy and this can't be spoken about. So going back to what, why I wanted to be part of this and the healing potential is because there are so many small children, small boys that have not had a voice. And I think this film is a real um, important opportunity for those who have been silenced to have a voice. And I think this is um, the beginning of many conversations for many people. Yeah. Um, and to, to really give attention to where many people in our community have been wounded. And so just real honor um, to you, Matt, for bringing this part of your story and for both actors, you know, for bringing in your wounding together in a way that can be thought about. And, but above all, handled with so much love. That's what really impacts me as I sit here, just how much love um, sort of cascades between um, all of you. So just appreciations um, to witness that. I would um, add to that, that it's, again, a master class or a mistress class, if we don't want to be patriarchal, um, <laughs> in how you can come together with wounds and not be destructive. Because I think the thing is people think, you know, you know, there's this thing, hurt people, hurt people, but it's not necessarily the destiny. And you've worked through the hurt with love, all of you. Um, I've, uh, so thank you very much for sharing that. I've got some questions from the audience. There's Jamie Starboisky, who says, the film ends on a cliffhanger with mum and Ben. Did they imagine that the mum's reaction be on said, or were there, was there a scene where she reacts and how did they imagine she would react in the film? So was a scene cut out or, you know, um, so you can talk through that process, Kieran and, and Matt, in your know, direction. Is that, is that Matt? <laughs> I see you pointing down. <laughs> or Jeremy. I don't know what you... So the film, the film was always about, not about what mom would say or wouldn't say, but the act of coming out and the act of speaking the words um, out for yourself. And I think that that's, one of the beautiful things about therapy is just getting the words out for yourself, bringing them from darkness into light is half the battle. And I never had any closure with my abuser. Um, I don't know where he is right now, um, but the Jerry Sandusky trial in, in the States was this massive trial that went on for years and years and years. And, um, it involved a high school coach who abused many um, little boys. And I remember reading about cicadas and how only the males cry out at night. And these cicadas, as, as uh, his mother says in the end, only come out every 13 and 17 years, this certain brood of cicadas. Um, and it had been 13 years before I told my best friend over AIM actually, AOL Instant Messenger, um, in a very quiet library where someone said, shh, right before I hit enter. Um, and it was 17 years before I told my mother. And I pictured there, um, you know, when Sandusky was finally convicted on that summer night, if you were on the East Coast, you could hear cicadas up and down from Virginia to Maine. And I picture at the end when Ben is finally about to tell his mother that all those cicadas, those, those are the boys, crying out with him and they're all together and he, you know they're cheering him on um I know I know how the story ends for me but I know that the story doesn't end so well for so many people so I didn't want to um I didn't want to end it on that note I just wanted to end it on the note of coming out and and speaking your truth thank you Matt um there's another question from Scudder Meyer um for the actors amongst us here an actor usually has to imagine how their character would feel and behave in a in a very emotional moment 
How is it different when you're not acting because you've actually lived through it? Is it easier or harder to do the scene? So um, from, you know, and, and Kieran, you're also an actor. So, you know, um, I don't know if Jeremy or Ramfis have done any acting at all. Um, but it's, you know, for the, for the main actors in this, how, how is it reenacting as opposed to, you know, inside as opposed to outside looking in sort of thing? Oh, as, as an actor, uh, we were all acting. I just want to be clear about that. Yeah. We were all, I mean, there are definitely moments where we're embodying and we're, and we're, we're in the moment being, or maybe even we're living, but we're still acting at the end of the day. Um, and, you know, some of these events are real lived events and some of these events are not necessarily how things went down. You know, this entire relationship with Ben and Sam, you know, that's, it's built in some realistic elements and there are some elements that we've added. Um, and so, you know, I think, you know, I don't like to think of actors as like, I'm turning on my switch and I'm turning it off. Sometimes it's like that. Sometimes you turn on the switch and the power's off. Sometimes you <laughs> turn on the switch and there's a spark and you're like, oh shit, what just happened? And it's that nuance and that sometimes unpredictability um, that are the moments where you get to discover truth, um, when you get to discover play, um and so you know we rehearse these scenes and then we would do these scenes and sometimes things would work and sometimes they wouldn't and we would have conversations about how that would uh, how i mean what's working and what's not working should we switch the lines around should we just improv this scene um and so you know we're, we're we, we are constantly working and trying to achieve truth in our in this film and i think that's what acting is that storytelling is is really at its essence trying to are we telling the story does it feel honest um and so you know even when you're dealing with experiences that you've lived through it can be hard to be honest because we've built walls right we've i've, I've dealt with that already i'm not going to go there you know um and so how do you, what, what do you do to, to, to let those walls down for your scene partner, for the camera, for the 13, 14 people around you, holding boom mics and shit, or waiting for the, you know, someone not to kick you out of the park for not having a permit, uh, <laughs> for filming out there. There are many things that are going on. Um, and so you, at the end of the day, you have to just, figure a way to how to insulate yourself and really be present with the one person you're in the scene with or the group of people you're in the scene with to tell that story. Um, so we're, we're, we're working hard, baby. We're out here acting. <laughs> <laughs> and I just want to even say, um, Matt, especially I, Matt really, really, really worked hard um, and getting to those moments, you know, cause that wasn't something that, you know, I, I came in as an actor and Matt came in as not knowing he's an actor and taking on this mantle of his own stories. But how do you protect yourself when you're trying to go there? You know, that's a huge thing we have to experience as actors. Um, and so, you know, he went for it and he did it. And it was a, it was a pleasure to share that experience, you know, and witness that. Um, and so it made me be on my A game too, you know, and Kieran in the space, you know, getting us to asking us questions and making sure we are staying truthful. Um, yeah, we're out here hard working for sure. Lives experiences or not, we are still, we're still out here. And this is a really good point. Thanks, Sheldon. You know, for people to know, even if you might have experienced something or not, and you, you know, you're still acting as the character, you're not acting as yourself. And that's the, you know, that's the skill of the actor, in a way to inhabit a character in a, in a movie. And I, I think it, it it's really well said, you know, uh, I'm getting like uh, signals. So I've got to, um, 
make sure all the people in the audience have their questions. Um, Jamie asked about the writing process. Um, uh, this is a very personal, heartfelt story that you've been involved in in front and behind the, ca the camera. Could you tell us about the writing process? So um, did any of the producers get involved in the writing process at all? Or did you just like go, OK, just you, Sheldon and Matt? Or did Kieran, did you have an input? But make it real short. <laughs> yeah, every, everybody read multiple drafts. Um, yeah, Ramfus, you read drafts. Jeremy, you read drafts, right? Kieran, Kieran, Kieran read many, many drafts. Uh, the first draft was written very quickly. It was written in about six weeks. I don't know if it was any good. That was the one that I sent to Sheldon. Um, and it just changed so many times over and over um, throughout uh, the winter and the spring, up until when we were shooting, as we were shooting, in the editing process. Yes, it, it evolved as many times as, as cicadas, so. Brilliant, thank you. And one last question to Joelle. I want you to um, say something to people who are gay or bisexual men who've gone through things like that. How do they start the process of healing? So if there are people out there in the audience who've gone through this, um, you know, brought you in here because of your therapeutic experience, what advice would you give them um, to start a healing process because you know everybody here has gone through theirs but they might be different and also if they're in America and we're in the UK so this is like transnational. Well I think that the film says something about speaking one's own truth and the importance of being witnessed and being heard by somebody else. So in one sense, one thing would be to be able to find somebody that you could potentially trust and begin to tell them what's happened to you. Another thing, sometimes that's not possible for some people. So it's the importance of being able to tell oneself. Sometimes you can't even say it out loud. So it might be just beginning to write it down or beginning to draw or even some of what has occurred. And the more that we can find a language to begin to um, um, describe or explain or give a voice to something which has happened to us, that then op offers the possibility to transform something. Because we notice in the film when, when Ben goes to therapy, granted it's not the most um, orthodox um, therapy. That <laughs> no, it wasn't. <laughs> but there's a lot of things around having that experience of the molestation named and how that begins to shift something to make sense of all of the bodily responses that he's having, all of the jokes that he keeps telling, and a way to actually then begin to come into relationship with himself and another. So I don't know if I've been a bit convoluted in my response, but ultimately it's something around being able to speak to somebody, be heard and be seen, and to have that experience of the little boy acknowledged. Thank you so much, Joelle. Um, I'm going to put one last question to everybody before we go, and that is, what are you all doing next? Um, really quickly, Remphis, Myrtle, what's your next project? If you want to share, just say what you're working on next. Um, wow, there's a ton of things. Oh, um, wow. I love, <laughs> lo no, seriously, that's so good. Um, well, uh, I am in post on a project called Ricky about a, um, a young black man that was uh, basically charged for a crime as a uh, adult when he should have not been charged at all. Um, it's inspired off a PBS doc that was done. And um, I just, you know, this was Chiquita was, you know, a lot of NYU, you know, crew and team, you know, uh, Jeremy was um, actually was graduating when we were shooting Chiquita. Uh, but this project as well um, is from an NYU grad, uh, his name was Saad Fret. Um, and um, uh, we were supported by the, the Spike Lee Foundation and Carrie Fukunaga actually came on as an EP and put some money in. So we're right now going through the, the post-production process, uh, really you know, excited about you know, sharing you know, the story um and uh having a social impact you know campaign 
you know, around that. Um, and I'm in a similar space doing a, um, a documentary about uh, uh, an, an older man that was incarcerated for 25 years for a crime that he did not commit. Um, he was essentially found innocent. And when you're found innocent, you don't qualify for government programs in the US. Um, and um, he did not get any restitution. So uh, it's a very upsetting story. Um, and uh, we're in the early process of you know, putting this together. Hopefully we'll be shooting in the coming months. Um, I'm gonna be working with Kevin Wilmot who did the, the Black Klansman. He was the writer you know, on that. So, um, and then um, I actually will be back in London um, in, in March. I have a, uh, a short called Fever. Um, it's uh, a queer love story uh, that deals with interracial dating as well. It'd be at the out there. Um, so, you know, stay tuned, you know, for that. And I'm, I have a small role in Matt's, uh, next project, which I'll let him talk a little bit about. Um, but yeah, a really exciting year, um, of, of projects that are all, uh, supportive and that have a social impact element around queer BIPOC and, uh, and women. Fantastic. Thank you. Can, where can people find you on Twitter, Instagram? Say so that I am uh, Memphis Myrtle on Facebook and Instagram. This is my full name. Um, I think it's Ramphis Myrtle official on Instagram. I'm also Ramphis Myrtle on LinkedIn. And to make everything easy, I'm Ramphis.net, just my name. I have a website, you know, so yeah. Perfect. So, Jeremy, what's next? Boom, uh, person. <laughs> and producer. Yeah. <laughs> like... I guess it's sort of a pivot. Uh, I, I mean, I'm putting out a comedy series for Grinder next month or in two months. That'll be online for your Grinder viewing pleasure and also on YouTube, I think. But it's way wow. less dark than this, so um, it's quite a quite a tonal shift. But yeah, I've been working on that, and then I'm putting out like a short documentary about Jeremy Lin and his social impact on Asian American stereotypes. Fantastic! And where can we find you on socials? Uh, Instagram is probably easiest, just my name, more or less. Okay, Jeremy Truong on Instagram. Fantastic. Sheldon, what's next? So I am here in Chicago. Um, I am going to be jumping into some stage work, hopefully. Omicron will be out of my life, hopefully. Fingers crossed, young. Um, and so I'll be doing some stage work here um, and also be working on an anthology um, comedy series called Hindsight um, that shoots next month. And I'm also teaching high schoolers. So I'll be teaching my freshman and sophomore students performance. Fantastic, thank you. And I see you've got at SB Terrence. SB Terrence. SB That's, Terrence, yeah. if anyone wants to follow me on the IG, uh, or you can just look up my name, Sheldon D. Brown, and you will find me. Sweet. And uh, Kieran. What's next for you? Is it acting, directing? Are you going to do more of that? Is it both? Is it writing too? I can't wait to find out. My, um, mm -hmm. I'm inspired by Matt and I'm working on, I'm developing a, a autobiographical um, uh, show oh. that I think that belongs in, in performance, in live performance, but it's about how I, I got um, kind of roped into this Korean cult um, I'm working on it with Daniel K. Isaac. It was years ago, this yoga studio that turned out to actually be a cult. And um, it's wildly funny, but it's um, also, I have to explain why, you know, so much around uh, around creativity is like, leave your comfort zone. And I think when you, you are a survivor of sexual abuse, your comfort zone is, you know, the difference between leaving your comfort zone and going to a place that your whole body is saying, no, mm, you know, is uh it can be hard to figure that out and so it's exploring that and um working on that with daniel k isaac i don't know where it will be um i've also been working with a great group called collab theater group they work with actors with disabilities um and they're based in new york really lovely uh and oh and i'm an associate producer on matt's next project which i will hand over to him and i'm on instagram my full name lot relentless animal videos Okay, <laughs> we'll be watching those animal videos. <laughs> and, and, and Matt, what's up, Matt? What's Hi. next? I wanted to quickly put in your like 
IG. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Good for um, people to see. Brilliant. I shot a queer horror film. It'll be out this Whoa. summer fall. It's called Treatment. It's about the violence that comes from the pathology of homosexuality and how it still exists within our own community and and um, within the set fabric of society and cinema because you know the subtext of, of horror has been queer since it yeah. began. Yes. Um, the genre began. And um, I jokingly told Gay Times magazine that I was doing masseusing and then they printed it. Um, so I guess I'm massaging now, so DM me for that. And um, what else? And then I'll be definitely working with Joel in some capacity because I'm in love with him and I, I cannot believe uh, he came to do this. Uh, this is so cool. We've been, we have done so many of these and the fact that we have um, Joel here is like, it just, it's a dream. And uh, I wish we had you the whole time. Um, Absolutely. So thank you. Yay. Thank you, Matt. I'm moving to Joelle. Joelle, where can people find you? Before you, what... find, before you find me there, Matt, we, we, you had some really good news. I wonder if you want to share that as well, just before we can. It hasn't been mentioned. Oh, I thought uh, it had at the beginning. Yeah. Has it? Yeah. yeah. yeah but nominated. mention it again. <laughs> we got nominated for a Spirit Award, uh, which I think is in March, right? The ceremony. And we just found out that we got a Queerty Nom for Best film, Indie Film of the Year. Good luck, <laughs> because you're gonna smash it. So, Joelle, you did the, you did the therapist thing, didn't you? Of going to, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> what about you? Oh, no, um, no, 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 we're, no. We're, we're, we're going to what about you, Joelle? <laughs> I was Don't so excited by the news. So I was like, I know, oh, I okay, about me, about me. So, um, yeah. um, next month, um, I'm collaborating with some um, people in the US. Um, there's a event called um, Buddhist Across Traditions. I'm not Buddhist, but I will be um, taking part in that um, um, conversation. And that's on the 30th of February, looking at inclusion in Buddhist communities. Um, in March, Confer, which is a psychotherapy organization, has a conference and I'll be presenting at that. Um, mm -hmm. That's March um, 14th, I believe. And in April, the Black African and Asian Therapist Network, we have our annual conference and I will be co-facilitating at that. So um, that's me for the next th three months. And I can be found at Joel Simpson underscore love notes on Instagram and on Twitter. I think I'm Joel Simpson soul. So that's me. Thank you, everybody. I've got to make some official announcements now, um, <clears throat> just to let everybody know. Campbell, where can people find you? You have to. Yeah. Oh, oh, people can find me on Campbell X on Twitter and Instagram, and um, yeah. So and thank you. You're great. Oh, bless you. Thank you too. Oh. Oh, thank you. Um, if you follow me, I'll follow you back. Ha. <laughs> So thank you. And now I'm going to say some official things for um, you in the audience and for everybody to know, spread the word about Cicada. It's out now. Also, um, I want to thank Mind Out LGBTQ who've partnered with us on this screening. They've been really supportive. So follow them on, on socials as well to keep up to date with what they're doing. Thank you to the BFI Audience Fund for supporting this event. Of course, nothing could go on without people who we don't see in the front. And this is like with film. Fortunately, we've got the two producers here. Often we don't see producers. So this is a kind of testament to the family, the beautiful family feel of Cicado. So I want to thank Amelia Cardinier, who's the um, comms director in Peccadillo, um, Alex, uh, Hewitt, who uh, worked with us um, in the background, doing all the technical stuff to make sure that it goes so smoothly as it has done tonight. Um, Matthew Briggs from Peccadillo Pictures and Tom Abel and Kaloon Loco are the uh, co-directors of Peccadillo Pictures. Thank you so much for attending. Thank you for your questions. Thanks once again, Remphis. Jeremy, Sheldon, Kieran, and Matt and Joel for um, being here tonight. We're going to um, play out our next um, film that we're going to be seeing, which is Ruangi, and um, the final little um, infomercial from Mind Out. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here, and good night! Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Jim. Oh, sorry, do, do we know each other? Anna here. Yeah? I'm Gerald's kid. Name's Kaz now. Holy shit. Holy fuck. You came back? It's me. Transgender. That's what it's called. That's me. Ten years you've been gone, and now you want to talk. There's your mum. You tell her. Your dad's been on this big environmental crusade. The whole cycle of phosphates is leaching the soil. It's time that us farmers took more responsibility for the harm that we do. It's really hard for me being here. It's hard for you. I'm trying to help you. You've been a man for what? Five minutes? I've been a man my whole life. You just didn't see it. I think I get it. Gender, it's, it's complicated. It's what I liked about you. You weren't like the other girls. It's because I wasn't one. Plastic Māori. I think I'm making a difference and that I can change things. Do you know what just happened in this? You needed a move. I want you here. Yeah. And I thought this would be weird, but it's not. Mind Out is essential because 40% of those who identify as LGBTQ will experience mental health challenges compared with 25% of the general population. Our work is vital because our service users do not get the support they need from mainstream services. They often feel isolated from LGBTQ plus communities and face additional discrimination and exclusion. LGBTQ plus people deserve a space where their identities are recognised and understood. To support LGBTQ plus people with mental health issues, we offer advocacy, counselling, peer mentoring, peer support groups, befriending, suicide prevention and online support. We are not just a charity, but a community that minds out for each other. For more information, head to mindout.org.uk.